Hi, people. How are you all? I'm gonna add in our. I will also have a co-host, which is pretty cool. So I'm excited for you to meet both of them. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Hello. How are you guys? Good. Good. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Um, so we're gonna give another minute for people to just sort of join on. Um, but like, how have your weeks been going? It's been good. It's as good as a Monday can go. <laughs> no, yeah, really for sure. Is. I definitely get that. I mean, both of you are so busy. Um, but no, yeah. Okay, so awesome. I think we're gonna get started. Um, so this is part of my um, AAPI Heritage Month um, panel with industry professionals. And so today we have a very special guest. So Kelly Yu is a Swedish born, New Orleans raised Chinese American writer, director, and photographer. When she was just 15, she founded her own freelance photo and editing business. Her list of clients has grown from national brands like Google and Glamour Magazine, all the way to content creators with over 20 million subscribers. Since then, she's moved to Los Angeles to be a student at the USC School of Cinematic Arts, majoring in film production. And most recently, her short film, Plum Town, was the subject of a high-profile crowdfunding campaign and is currently in the festival circuit, where it has received, so far, the Grand Jury Award at IFF Boston and Best Narrative Honorable Mention at NFFTY. The feature script um, of the short film also holds a ranking of nine, which is incredible on the blacklist. And so if you're not in entertainment, that's um, definitely a very high achievement. And then I'm also joined today um, with Van Moto Media by Faith. So Faith is um, a student at the USC School of Cinematic Arts. Um, she's a young arts alum and just finished principal photography on her own short film, The One Who Abandoned Me. Um, and so today I wanted our live stream to be, you know, a conversation um, between creatives. And uh, I think, you know, Kelly, definitely after Plum Town, I'm sure you've gone through the whole process and you've seen how that is and you're, are you a junior or a senior at USC? I'm a senior, uh, technically. Um, I'm graduating a semester early, so that makes me like a first semester senior. Okay, awesome. So like yeah. we have a senior production major, a freshman production major. And so yeah, I just thought it'd be a really great opportunity and I'm excited. Um, so thank you for both of us. Uh, sorry, thank you to both of you for joining <laughs> um, us today. And so I guess my first question is, when did you, so you were born in Sweden, when did you move to uh, the United States? Yeah, so I moved uh, to the US when I was six, uh, which is an interesting age to move to a new country, especially one with like a different language. Uh, because surprisingly enough, my first language uh, was, or my first two languages were Swedish and Chinese. I did not know any English. And the minute I moved to America and picked up English, uh, I, it like swapped with Swedish. Like I completely lost the ability to speak Swedish, picked up English. Um, I think it has to do with the age that your brain is like forming. I think like six is like the cutoff. <laughs> so if you stop like speaking the language at that age, then you immediately lose it. Um, so yeah, I moved to Minnesota actually, which a lot of people don't know. Um, my dad is a professor. So he kind of just moved us wherever he was studying at. Uh, so we did like a two year uh, stint at a university in Minnesota, and then um, we moved to New Orleans. Uh, and I grew up there and call New Orleans home till this day. Yeah, that's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, hi, this is like the first time I'm speaking. Um, yeah, so I guess to kind of start talking more about uh, creative processes and just sort of like having a career in film. When was sort of that moment that you decided that you wanted to pursue this, um, like, for real, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think because we all go to USC schools in Ireland, um, being at a place like film school, like, it's at least my experience is like all of my peers were kind of like, there was a common phrase that everyone used to throw around that was like, I was like, born for cinema or I was like I was raised by like filmmakers or everyone comes from either like their parents are in the industry or their parents have always loved film um maybe never fulfilled that filmmaking dream of 
their own and like want, you know, have always encouraged their kids to do that as well. Um, but I'm the complete opposite. My parents, I think, watch like one movie a year. Um, we're never like I was never introduced to Star Wars or Harry Potter or, you know, the classics as a kid. I had to discover that on my own because I, I really loved books when I was young. And that's how I kind of like found those classical films that everyone references now. Um, but yeah, I, I think like being uh, in the kind of like Asian American community uh, grew up you know, playing all the musical instruments. I played violin my entire life, piano. Um, and because my parents are academics, it was always like, you're gonna do STEM, you know, and like, that's gonna be a stable career. And for some reason, I just had like, none of those genes. I was terrible at math, terrible at science, like just did not have any of that. Um, so I think I was just always, and I was an only child too. So I was always like drawn to the creative arts, I think for like expression and just like kind of finding things to do with my time. Uh, Cause I was by myself growing up, but yeah, it kind of, uh, I guess started out of rebellion almost in a way. Cause I remember being 15 and, uh, my high school, uh, offered these concentrations in art, uh, different like art mediums, like orchestra, media arts, um, and because I was always that orchestra kid, I was like, oh, I'm going to like concentrate in orchestra. Like that makes sense. And I was like, wait, what is this new thing called like media arts, which was at the time like graphic design, it was photography, videography, filmmaking. Um, and that was like a whole, like I had this crisis, like as an eighth grader, I was like, whatever I choose is going to like become my identity. And I realized like if I had chosen a concentration in orchestra, I would have never probably gotten a chance to touch any other form. Um, but I was like, okay, I'll try this new thing. And, you know, music will always be there. And so, yeah, I like uh, took classes in photography, took classes in how to use like Adobe and um, realized it was like a really good way to kind of combine everything I loved. And also at that time, my mom was kind of like, I, I clashed with my mom a lot. She's like, why aren't you like putting that time into like ACT tor tutoring and like math and doing all that. And she's like, you'll never make any money if you don't pursue that. And I was kind of like, you know what, bet, like, I'm going to prove it to you. And I was like, wait, I think I can like make money with a camera. So I started taking photos, I started freelancing. And my parents are so supportive, but they're the type of parents where like, you have to prove to them, like you can back up what you're trying to do. So I think once my parents kind of saw that they're like okay like she can actually like do something with this and yeah so I just did that throughout high school mo mostly like uh photography stuff videography stuff editing and then uh it came time for college applications and I still didn't because I wasn't that person who was like oh I want to go to film school like that's my dream like I had no idea I was like I'm, I like entrepreneurship I liked like you know start having my own business running that I was like maybe I'll do business school maybe I'll do music school um, and then I realized that like film was the combination of everything I loved and with film, like you don't ever have to give up something like film is writing, it's music, it's photography, it's being entrepreneurial. It's kind of the combination of everything. So yeah. And then USC just, you know, uh, was very well regarded. And I also, it seemed like a very versatile place where everyone kind of was pursuing different interests. So yeah, I applied and the rest is history you know here <laughs> yeah that's awesome yeah and I think especially with that thing of film being sort of all things at once like literally it's so many different industries like packed into one I think it's like it's really it's really is true um mm -hmm. and I guess speaking on USC um so I'm also not from LA um so I'm interested to kind of hear your perspective on like what it was like to first come to like this huge metropolitan area where like everyone's so like deeply immersed into film how did that like mm. feel you know yeah I still like marvel at it every day because I come from a place where like no one really was making movies like mm -hmm. there wasn't ever a crew <laughs> for a film like you are just like you shoot everything you write everything you direct everything um so I remember stepping foot at USC and like meeting my cohort and being like wait oh my gosh everyone does this like everyone this is everyone's passion everyone like wants to make films I for the first time like was like wait I don't feel alone I don't feel like I'm the only person trying to do that until this day I'm like it still feels like a luxury that there's just an endless like collaboration never halts or never ceases in this town because like everyone is working on something cool um so my first year like it was 
great. Um, the USC curriculum is set up in a way where your first year you don't really, you don't really go on set. Um, it's not like required for class, but a lot of like upper like junior thesis films are happening and freshmen are like, you know, crawling over each other to like throw on them. Um, so I was so lucky I found um, this or I crewed on this trio of these junior thesis films. Um, they're groups of like three classmates who make three films in a semester. And um, I had such a good time. I like stayed with them throughout all three of their films. Um, and that was the first time I got to witness just like the collaboration and how like everyone kind of like works together. Um, so still that's something like I s never had that gr growing up. Um, and that's kind of why I wanted to go to film school too. Cause I was like, wait, I love making films. Imagine what it's like to actually be able to make something with like 10, 20 people. Right No. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I definitely remember the first time I did like a film program. It was like down in Manhattan and like being able to be with people your age who share like the same passion. Um, it's just like fantastic. And like, there's nothing like it, like, opportunity wise it's just like amazing yeah mm -hmm. um and so you of course i mean have so many like you said new orleans but born in sweden chinese american so you have all these different identities and i was wondering um how does that influence your work or the intersectionality like how does that influence the work you do yeah i mean that's a great question um i grew up i think one of my the earliest questions i remember asking my mom like just being like this like young kid as cheesy as it sounds like, I would go to my mom and be like, where do I belong? Like, because Sweden has this rule where like, you don't get automatic citizenship if you're born there. Um, you get whatever your parents are. And so even though I was born in Sweden, like Sweden never like claimed me as a citizen. Um, and my parents were Chinese citizens at the time. So I automatically got Chinese citizenship, but I'd never been to China. So for like, until I was 14, I walked around with a Chinese passport and everywhere I went, I had to get a visa because I wasn't an American citizen. And that just didn't feel right to me because it's like, I'm a Chinese, I have a Chinese passport. Like I've never been to China. Like I speak Chinese. Like I, you know, when I uh, visited China for the first time, um, I went to this like local high school. My grandpa was like, I'm going to put you in this high school and you're going to learn your Chinese is going to get better. Um, and I set foot and they knew I was visiting from America and like one kid like points at me and they're like, American girl, American girl. Like that's just what they called me, even though I spoke fluent Chinese. And obviously like being growing up in New Orleans, like I never, you know, I was always Chinese, like in their eyes. Um, so yeah, like having a Chinese passport never felt right. Um, and when I was 14, my mom took the test to become nationalized. So I became an American citizen with her. Um, so that finally like feels right because America is my home. I feel American, but still at the same time, it's like, you're never fully American because you know, I'm Chinese. Um, so yeah, in my work, I guess a lot of it is just like how, because I, I'm trying to explore this more recently now because, you know, it's Asian American narratives are, you know, um, we've come a long way. There's still a long way to go. But, you know, with Crazy Rich Asians and Minari and The Farewell, like there's more opportunity now for Asian American stories. Um, but what's interesting, which I think a lot of people don't know about Plum Town is um, Plum Town and the work I'm doing now, I've always questioned if it fell within the strict Asian American narrative, um, because in a way it's not really. Um, a lot of my films are set in China, in Mandarin, about Chinese characters. Um, they're obviously from my perspective. For example, Plum Town is about kind of my father and my grandfather, um, but they're not Asian American. I'm Asian American, so I feel like by extension, like it is. Um, but I think because I've grown up kind of with a toe in between all these different worlds, um, I'm more interested in exploring um, the East meets West narrative, um, kind of how we can bridge these different cultural absurdities, but also how we can understand these absurdities as more of a truth, you know, in Eastern and Western culture. Um, so that's kind of uh, what I'm drawn to now. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of things about like Asia, like Asian culture that like Westerners see as like crazy or absurd or like really just like strange. Uh, but if you unpack it further, you realize like we're not that di different. Yeah, that was, yeah.
a large part of that is because of just the different backgrounds that I've come from. Yeah. Sorry. The, yeah, it cut out a little bit there, but <laughs> that was really beautifully said. Sorry to interrupt you Thank a little you. bit at the end. No, um, no, no. So yeah, um, I know you did mention Palm Town, which is obviously this film uh, you guys are in the process of, of sort of, you know, creating. Um, so I'd love for you to sort of walk us through uh, how things have been so far, where they're sort of heading with that project specifically. Yeah, so it's it's actually crazy because like a year ago today, we were crowdfunding for Plum Town, and so much of that crowdfunding campaign was like doing live streams and back then like Clubhouse was such a big thing. Um, so doing that, so it's just crazy, like a year goes by so fast. Um, but yeah, so um, when I graduated high school, uh, as many Chinese kids do, when you graduate high school, you get sent back to the motherland and you do your little like rounds and collect all your, you know, gifts from your relatives. It's very much like, oh, you graduated high school, like it's time for you to like connect with your roots, visit the grandparents, do all that. Um, so that was 2019. And the last time I had visited my relatives and been in China was 2013. Um, so there had been like quite a gap in between. And when I visited in 2013, like I was so young, I did not want to be there. Uh, my relatives on my dad's side live in the countryside. So it's like, for someone who's not accustomed to that kind of like way of living, like it's pretty rough for like a very like young, privileged, like <laughs> American girl, because uh, they literally live in the countryside, like in huts, like no AC, like nothing. Um, so my memories of being in China in 2013, like were not great. I think I was literally dragged, like kicking and screaming there. Um, and so I, when I visited 2019, I think I was old enough to be like, you know what, I really want to connect with my grandparents, even though they speak a different dialect, even though there's that like gigantic disconnect between us. Um, so I visited and just driving into the countryside, it like the change and like in China within the past few years was astounding because I remember the countryside being very much like something stuck in the past, like very rural farmers, like they're into all their livelihood was just farming. Um, but we drove past farmers who are still selling like their vegetables on the side of the roads, but now all of them had like plastic QR codes uh, because China in the past few years has gone virtually cashless. Like it's all an automated tech centered society um and no one carries cash anymore like you have like qr codes and then you have your iphone or your smartphone and you scan it and that's how you pay taxis that's how you pay grocery stores um and it's this like little slice outside of the city where farmers are like struggling to adapt to that like they're still like farming and doing like their old way of life but they have all these like you know those wechat qr codes um trying to kind of it felt like this weird like in between world, <laughs> like stuck in the past and trying to adapt to the future. And that was like the first image like seared into my head. Um, so I visit my grandparents, I spend time with them and I'm like, hey, how how's the farming going? Cause that's like the only thing I can remember from the last time I was here. And my grandpa like looks me in the eyes and he's like, oh, like we don't farm anymore. Like we sold our land like three years ago um, to this factory. And now we work in the factory and now we like, it you know, we have a better quality of life because we, um, you know, can make a steady income now. And that kind of just stayed with me, just like this sudden, like nonchalant, like, oh, yeah, we don't do that anymore. Like everything our family has been doing for generations, we just don't do that anymore. Um, but it wasn't necessarily a terrible thing because like now they have money, they, my cousins were able to go to school. Um, so that kind of the story just stayed with me when I went back home and uh, yeah, my freshman year, I wrote Plum Town, The Future, and it was kind of inspired by that story. Uh, it was more of a comedy about feuding farming families who have to unite and save their land when a corrupt corporation comes. It's kind of like, I described it as like Game of Thrones, but with like farmers, like Chinese farmers. Um, and yeah, I then met uh, my really good friend now, Thomas, who was on this stream a few days ago. Uh, and Thomas was the first one that kind of challenged me to turn it into a short because at that time, I think it was sophomore year, we had been doing Zoom for so long. I was really frustrated with like just not actually having a director sample that I was proud of. And I wanted to make a short. And at that time, I brought a different script to him. Like, what do you think? Like, should I make this as a short? And he was like, yeah, I like it. But like, why? Like, 
why not make Plum Town the short? And at that time, I was like, oh, because, you know, I have to, like, go to China and, like, I, like, all the set pieces and the action. And he was the first one that kind of challenged me, like, short films don't really have, or proof of concepts don't have to be, like, the literal version of the feature. As long as it's, like, thematically connected, as long as you're trying to get across a similar idea, it can be whatever you want. And that's when it kind of started. Like, I, he really inspired me to adapt it into a short film, entirely different characters, different uh, setting. Um, but yeah, from there on on, like, we just uh, assembled the producing team and decided to crowdfund it and got amazing support from the community uh, and shot May of last year. And now, a year later, we're uh, kicking off our festival run and it's surreal, like, having people see it now um and it's just been a great journey wow that's awesome and so i mean that's such a long period of time too um which i guess you know it's like art it takes a long time um <laughs> but so like what were what did you come across certain like struggles you weren't expecting throughout the process um yeah, I mean, I think the first one is just um, the self-doubt, especially. I think it's crazy. Like, when we choose to, like, make or to be filmmakers, it's, like, you're literally signing up for a life of just, like, constant, <laughs> like, self-doubt and rejection and, like, learning to take no's not at face value. Um, so with something like Plum Town, because we were trying to crowdfund at least $20,000, a lot of people think you just like set up a Kickstarter and you like post a few things on social media and then you're just going to like get the money. Um, but it doesn't work like that. Like you have to, it is a full-time job and every single minute you have to be doing outreach and you have to be um, putting it in people's faces. And that was really difficult to learn how to do um, because I think as filmmakers, we're used to like sending our work out be like, hey, like, can you look at my film? Can you look at this? But when it comes to asking people for money, then that becomes like a whole different thing. Um, so that was a huge learning curve. And also like with Kickstarter, something we were offering uh, investors above a certain level is like, if you invest this amount of money, you get an associate producer credit. And that was the first time I've ever experienced like bringing outside people into a film. And for a little bit, I was like struggling with feeling like I was giving away pieces of myself to these strangers, um, especially such a personal film. But um, I love my associate producers. They are the most supportive like people ever. What is what was so great about this whole process is like we really built a community. Um, and you know, it's cool you have people like strangers you don't know like cheering you on and be like, Oh, like today's our first day of shooting, guys, and like they're invested because like they donated money. Um, so that yeah, that was a big learning curve. Uh and then yeah, other challenges were just like navigating um relationships especially with my peers and my friends and I realized I was talking to a friend a while ago and I've done so many podcasts and Q&A's about Plum Town and it's all about like the good that comes out of making your first bigger budget short outside of school um, but we were talking about how like no one really talks about what comes with it so I actually do want to touch upon this um, film school is like such a interesting environment to navigate because you're put in a place of like 20 something year olds who all want to do the same thing like everyone wants to be a filmmaker everyone wants to be a director um so navigating kind of I'm trying to think of like the best way to put it um making something that kind of garners you a modicum of attention um navigating your relationships with your peers was a big learning curve uh, because Plum Town was the first like budgeted short I've made and I wanted for example to hire like a professional DP like I wanted to hire a production designer who like has experience and after wrapping Plum Town um, started to hear things like my classmates not being happy with the fact that you know they weren't hired to be the DP or they weren't hired to be the production designer. Um, people feeling left out, you know, like naturally, right? Because um, I think it's human nature. Um, and so I think navigating those like interpersonal relationships, especially with your peers is something that I don't feel enough 
people talk about and enough people discuss um, when it comes to like young filmmakers or young film students. Um, so that's something I'm still like grappling with now. Um, it's, it's like a tricky thing to navigate, but I think it's, you know, it's natural. Like it comes with any process of making something and putting yourself out there and especially filmmaking, like it involves so many people. Um, so yeah, does that make sense? You know, what I'm trying to say is like, yeah, just what comes with, you know, making something outside. I think the minute you decide to make something outside a sphere or an environment that is comfortable, um, then yeah, what comes arises from it is, is a, can be tricky, uh, like navigating those relationships. Yeah, very right, fair. Right. Um, yeah, so you said this was your first, uh, like, budgeted short, which is awesome. Uh, how did it, how was your sort of experience then directing that, um, you know, being in like the production process and like being on set and things? Yeah, I mean, it was definitely a learning curve, especially working with the DP for the first time. Um, but I feel so lucky that my DP, Phillips, and the people I worked with were, you know, so good at what they do, have been doing this for so long, but are so patient and willing to guide you through it. Um, there was never, I think I walked in very early on being like, wait, I'm a director. Like, I need to prove myself. I need to pretend like I know what I'm doing. But very quickly then I was like, you will get nowhere if you try to put that front up. Um, so I had a DP. I worked, I think, most closely initially with my DP because we just spent hours and hours. Wait, sorry, Han, you cut out for just like a brief second. Would you mind? My mom that keeps last calling sentence? me. That's why. My mom keeps calling me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put. Uh, I'm... That's all good. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was saying that like um, I worked really closely with my DP, not only just like discussing shot list and what pertained to the film, but honestly just like character. And I, lo I learned a lot from him. Um, and also, yeah, learning with like a more, ex working with a more experienced editor, uh, working with more experienced producers. Um, so it was like very intimidating. I felt like I had a lot of learning to do. I read so many books, watched so many master classes on directing. I was so scared that I would step foot on set and not know how to direct and not know how to like, you know, handle uh, a production this big. But something kicks in when you step foot on set, when it all comes together, because you do so much preparation beforehand. Um, and our, our first shoot day was insane. We had like 45 shots scheduled. Um, I was told that there was no way we were going to be able to get all of them. So like be prepared to cut shots as you go. And yeah, it was, it, we started out with like the most intensive day, but something kicks in when it all happens. We step on foot and it really becomes very simple. It's like, what is the scene? What are the shots you need to get? And because I understood the story so well, because we had done all those, that prep work beforehand, it kind of just, yeah, something like instinctual kicks in and you just, you just do it. And then the day's over. <laughs> and then you're like, wait, why do I feel like I want to collapse? Oh, because we've been doing this for like 13 hours. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, looking back on the project, I think you have so much like insight into, you know, the whole process. Um, and so what sort of advice would you give to people who want to be doing what you're doing or what you did with Plum Town, what sort of advice looking back would you have for them? Yeah, I think, um, because this is the best advice I was given, like no one's gonna hand you something. Um, filmmaking is very expensive. Uh, everything that comes with it, you know, comes with like the right timing and the right thing. Uh, but what, so if you can't wait around for something to be handed to you, you have to create that for yourself. And from the, before I even stepped foot in USC, uh, I told my friend I wanted to be a writer director, or I told my friend I want to be a director. And he said, the cheapest and the most accessible form of directing is for you to write a script because you do that on your time. You don't have to get permission from anyone. And in doing so, you take control of your future. Uh, and of the stories that you want to make. Um, and Lulu Wong, this, you know, amazing director that I look up to, uh, she got to make her film. A lot of people think, like, incorrectly think that 
you know, she happened to go on a podcast, the right producers happened to hear her story and they offered her this A24 film. Um, but that's not the case. Uh, people are like, oh, you just got lucky. Uh, but she has this quote where she talks about luck favors the prepared. And she says, you don't know that behind the scenes, the past 10 years, everything I've been doing to this point is to prepare myself. So when the chance comes, then I'm prepared. So I think everyone gets a shot. Everyone gets lucky in their life. But what distinguishes you and what sets you apart is if you're prepared or not. Um, and no one ever is going to give you permission to do that. Um, so just do it. You know, if it's, the, if it's write that first short or write that first screenplay, if it's make that short. Um, yeah, I, I quickly realized, especially at USC, I think so many people think, oh, I'm at USC. I'm at, I'm at the best film school in the world. Like just by me going here is going to be enough to set me up. And that's so not true. Um, and so, yeah, I think once you realize that, uh, yeah, it's just, you know, taking initiative and paving your own path and yeah. And the rest is up to, you know, you and the world to decide. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and so then with Plum Town specifically, uh, what would you say your plans are like with it moving forward? Um, I know you did mention it, you know, started as a feature script. Yeah. Um, I would, because I think till this day, Plum Town is the most personal story. Uh, it is literally my family story. So it is my passion project. I would love to make the feature one day, but I think it's also important to be aware of like timing and when is the right time for something. So a lot of people are like, why aren't you trying to actively develop your feature now? And like, you know, you have the short out there, like, why are you working on other projects? Um, my gut tells me that like now is just not the time um to make something like this i have the feature i it's old you know there's making the short dramatically changed how i view the feature i want to write like a completely different movie version of it um but right now i'm concentrating on other stories uh but plum town is always going to be in the back of my mind it's gonna, always going to be the first film i wrote the first you know most personal thing i have um also with the political climate like china's going to sleep for like the next 15 years so i don't think anyone's getting in <laughs> um so there's also that to consider um but yeah it's it's like always going to be that passion project it's interesting because people think like the first feature that a director makes is their passion project but that's not necessarily true um so yeah i'm just hopefully one day i can get to make it yeah, no, I mean, we all hope so, too. Um, and I, I guess that sort of segues into our, like, final two questions. It's sort of a bit more, like, light lighthearted and, like, fun. Um, but so, like, where do you see yourself in five years? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Jeez, so much could change, like, tomorrow. <laughs> um, I don't even know what I'm going to eat tomorrow from the coast. Um, I, I think I would love to make my first feature in the next five years. Um, this feature that I'm writing right now, I would love to make as my first. Um, but it's going to be an uphill battle because for some reason I'm just drawn to like unmarketable, un I, not unmarketable, but uh, the stuff that I'm drawn to, especially with that East meets West lens is um, stuff that's hard still, like with our climate, like still hard to get made. But I have all the faith in the world, especially with the content that we're seeing now. I think people are starting to open up to the idea of like, a foreign language film or something that's not what you know we're, we've been used to seeing our entire lives um so yeah i'm excited for that and this uh this year up until next year i'm going to be working on a second short which is a proof of concept for this feature um and yeah so just excited for that but yeah so within the next five years definitely want a first feature under my belt yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, oh my gosh, I can't wait to see like all the projects you're working on. Um, you keep you. teasing them. Um, and then, <laughs> so yeah, our, la our, our last question, um, which is something I ask like everyone who comes on here, um, just like a fun, like shoot your shot type thing. Who is your like dream collaborator to work with either like as an actor or behind the camera? Oh my gosh. Um, this is so not like, on brand <laughs> but um well okay dream collaborator uh one of my favorite directors unfortunately is not alive anymore but if this is like in dreamland like hypothetical um it's taiwanese director edward yang uh who's influenced 
so much of my work. He is like the one person, like if he was still alive, like I would love to, you know, meet him, at least like shake his hand and like thank him. Um, but in terms of behind the camera, um, this is so out of left field, but I am in love with Jodie Comer. She's this Scottish actress who uh, famously is known for being in the BBC show Killing Eve alongside Sandra O. Oh. But I've known about her before anyone else has because uh, I watched her in the Stars period show. And I think she's just incredible to look at, uh, like just see on screen and it would be an honor. I just also would not be worthy. She's just amazing. Um, but in terms of like behind the screen talent, um, she's just one of my favorite actresses. Um, but in terms of like, Asian American actors. Oh my gosh, Alan Kim would be a dream to <laughs> work with. Uh, he's in Minari. He's a little kid in Minari. Um, I think he's just the cutest, and I would fangirl so hard <laughs> if I if I met him and was able to have him in something. But, yeah. No, no, yeah, absolutely. I mean, those are those are some great choices. Um, mm -hmm. But no, yeah. So I want to. Unfortunately, that's the end of our live stream. But um, I want to thank everyone who joined, and thank you, Kelly, for coming and. Of totally. course, Faith for being my wonderful co-host today. Um, and so, yeah, we have Nina Luan, who's an actress um, who's on Disney Channel for a while um, tomorrow. And so be sure to join that. Um, and until then, yeah, thank you for joining. Happy AAPI Heritage Month. And I'll see you soon. Yeah, thank you so much. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.